จําได้อันนี้เป็นรูปสมเด็จพระราชบิดาท่านก็เสด็จไปที่บอสตันศึกษาแพทย์จาก Harvard Medical School นะแล้วกลับมาก็พยายามจะ medical practice in Thailand is impossible as a พระเจ้าคนไข้ก็ไม่ยอมให้ถูกตัวก็มาที่ m a c c o m i c k ใช่ไหมก็เป็น the father of Thailand medicine so you need to follow his path go to uh, US for further training ผมก็เคยเป็นนักชังพาก็อย่างเห็นเงี้ยทุกวัน I used to take a lot of photographer so I'll show you a few one just keep you awake How many people, as a med student, can have close-up picture the queen? And we were very fortunate in those days. The first time when the king and the queen came to Phum Ping, we got invitation as a medical student from Chiang Mai Medical School to have the audience and the dinner with the king and the queen. Sing and play the piano for us. Priceless, but I kept it for 40 years. <laughs> and how many medical students can sit right next to the queen? See, this is uh, the six, seven Chiang Mai class goes there. And my classmate behind the queen, <laughs> he from Lampang. And then See, when the king play saxophone, and we sit behind the queen and listen to the king play saxophone, and this all is our medical student in those days. Same. Okay, quick one. Anybody know who this gentleman is? No, Doctor Stang Mongkonsu. He is the first founder. Of medical side, the Jan Tang, so my name Lim Thanon Si, is it? Been con out to Rocky Feller Foundation, ma hai nak lien, or pet, bay yu tang te. Gap ma ben a Jan Kemi Biochem, so he's a founder of basic side of Thailand. So most of the medical student in Bangkok go to. University medical side to study basic side. It's very hard to have full flesh basic side teaching. Laksud lao tat lue pe ki pi? Song pi? Pok te la meung nok laksud basic side si pi. Lao ka kun lien pad ik si pad pi. Lao tat lue si o. Anybody know him? John Thong Suk Phong Chathat, Son Kemi, nah. Anybody know him? Buret Kham Thong, the first Atikan Body Maharaja Chiang Mai, Son Kemi, like that. Thong Suk Son Chemistry, he's teaching organic chemistry. The Queer Sat Gan Pass Mai Noon, John Bun Som Martin, John Mo Le Biep, John Mo Chang, John Awut. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce our moderator for this afternoon sessions, Dr. Susan Cram. She got her receive her MD from Duke University, and she did her internship in internal medicine at the University of Kentucky. She also was a fellow at in electron microscopy and oncology at the University of Kentucky Armed Forces Institute of Pathology. And she also uh, did her fellow after that in orthopedic pathology at the Hospital for Joint Diseases Orthopedic Institute that's in New York. Uh, currently, she held a position of associate professor in pathology in the Department of Pathology, <coughs> excuse me, Texas Tech University Health Sciences Center. So please, uh, Dr. Cram. All right, it's my job today to moderate and introduce uh, our speakers for this afternoon, um, who I think will, uh, especially in neurology, will reiterate what Dr. Norman was saying this morning. 
and actually we'll have uh, endocrinology following that. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Ni uh, Nijatsi uh, Suenwela. She was trained and uh, still works at Chulalongkorn University in Bangkok uh, and received, she is a neurologist and director of their stroke service there. She received training um, on an, a foundation scholarship uh, in cerebrovascular disease in Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts and uh, has been, that she finished that in 1996 and she's been in private practice there, or at, the, at the university there, sorry, since then. Uh, so she's going to be talking to you about neurology, and welcome. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here and uh, discuss with you about the cases of neurology. I think I'll uh, do it in Thai because I look at the audience and understand that most of you, all of you are Thai, so uh, you, want, you prefer English? <laughs> All right, I'll speak both languages then, <laughs> back and forth. So for neurology part of it, uh, I'll be covering many uh, specialties, starting with dementia, stroke, epilepsy, vertigo, infection, MS, which is not common here, but uh, there are some, many of them in the, in the exam, headache, peripheral neurology, and others. So I'll start with uh, the dementia part of it. Uh, and most of the questions about dementia are uh, mainly covered in, in Alzheimer's disease. Because as you know, in Caucasian, Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia. And although in Thailand, we have some other types of dementia, like vascular dementia. So let's start with the first question. This is a 77-year-old woman who had a problem of memory loss and actually her family concerned that she had Alzheimer's disease. And she also seems to be confused and uh, sometimes wandering aimlessly around the house and neighborhood. And she gets angry very easily. And sometimes she starts laughing or crying without any reason. And, uh, oops, <laughs> came out too bad. Anyway, uh, so she had this history for quite a while. And he, finally, she came to you as a family doctor. And after you did a complete physical and neurological examination, what would you do for the first diagnostic step workup in this patient? Would you draw the blood for HIV testing? Would you get a CT scan of the brain? Would you order B12, calcium, and, and thyroid levels? Would you order neuropsychological tests, or would you perform a lumbar puncture? Can we have a vote? Or you saw the answer already, so we don't have to vote for this question. Anyway, any answer? You saw it. All right, so I'll just start with uh, answering myself. <laughs> the first thing that we should do is to exclude the treatable causes of dementia. And these are ordering B12, calcium, and thyroid level. Many of you would be, I think, would consider getting a CT scan of the brain, but uh, if the patient has dementia, the first imaging that we prefer to do would be MRI instead of CT because it gives more detail. So in this case, uh, ordering the blood test would be the good answer for this question. So just briefly mention about dementia. As you know, it's the disease uh, which has the criteria as this, the impairment of memory. And at least one of the followings, for example, in impairment of abstract thinking, judgment, abnormalities, personality change, or other cortical functions. And that has to be severe enough to cause social or occupational problems in the absence of delirium. And for the causes of dementia, you know, the this is a category that I actually like. They categorize them as very common type of dementia, common, less common, and uncommon. So very common would be Alzheimer's disease. This is from, from uh, Western textbook. So it's around 50% of the patients who had Alzheimer's disease. Uh, less commonly, we'll have vascular dementia or mixed type of dementia. And less, less common, but uh, very important because these are treatable causes of dementia. They are hypothyroid, B12 deficiency, alcohol drinking. So we have to look for these, these uh, entities 
in, in people with dementia to exclude treatable causes. And there are some other uncommon causes like degenerative cases, hydrocephalus, prion, HIV, sub subdural hematoma. So in this case, uh, we would consider doing the test for, to exclude the treatable causes. Next question, I'll try not to answer myself, okay? <laughs> uh, this is a patient with a 36-year-old man with Down syndrome. Actually, the questions are very long. It takes a lot of time to read all of them. You just, for, for the sake of time, you just glance through the questions and try to pick up the uh, important words. For example, this case is a Down syndrome person. And he's having problem with his work. And uh, in the past few months, he, he has become increasingly forgetful in his job and uh, had problems with his job, which he has been doing before. And that's why he came to the hospital and uh, had problem with uh, vocabulary when he speaks. And uh, he doesn't have any past history of any problems, uh, including any thyroid abnormalities, B12 deficiency, or any other problems. So this is a Down syndrome patient who came with progressive uh, forgetfulness. And what would you think of uh, differential diagnosis of the condition in this patient? Dementia, secondary to renal failure, which he doesn't have, Huntington's disease, Parkinson's dementia, Alzheimer's, or vascular dementia. So the clue is Down syndrome is related to what? Can you vote? All right. Am I speaking too fast? No? Okay. No answers? <laughs> okay, all right. So most people answer D, as I mentioned before. If you don't know anything, you just answer Alzheimer's because it's a common <laughs> type of dementia. And uh, in patients with Down syndrome, it's uh, commonly that they, they actually have pathology of uh, Alzheimer's at the beginning and they actually uh, can have pro progression to Alzheimer's disease. So most of you get the correct answer. So next, very long question again, but I'll try to just summarize it. This is a 74-year-old man, lived uh, with his sister, it doesn't matter, but uh, he has some behavioral change and uh, he has forgetfulness, which is the major problem of th this patient over the past year. And uh, he often forgets to lock the, to lock the bathroom door and uh, he uh, wanted to come to the doctor because he wanted to prove that he was okay. He doesn't, so actually he denies the illness. He doesn't feel that he is abnormal, but uh, the sister thought that he had some problem, especially with his memory. And he had the mental status examination, which shows abnormality. So he was diagnosed as having Alzheimer's disease type of dementia. So you just glance through it and saw, oh, it's Alzheimer's. This is, if you have so many questions to look at. So the question was, this patient has clinical picture of dementia, Alzheimer's type, and what's the most appropriate next step to manage this patient? 74-year-old man with Alzheimer's, would you admit them to a geriatric unit? Would you begin the treatment with the nebisil and keep the patient at home? Would you re reassure the family, giving some vitamins? And, or would you do the brain biopsy or recommend to uh, close supervise him, closely supervise him. I would like to vo vote. For Alzheimer's patient, very kind of moderate to severe case. Oh, huh. The answer is, the correct answer would be B, actually. Oh, most of the people got the E as the answer. Re recommend a residential facility. So actually, in the Alzheimer's patient, we try to keep them at home as much as possible because changing environment would make him more confused. So it would be best to keep him at the same place unless you can't take care of him anymore. So just keep him at home. And in this case, we should try some medications. So for Alzheimer's disease, now we have medication to help the symptoms. Not treating the disease, but help him to be more uh, independent, more, uh, more uh, less forgetful. 
So the treatment now is the cholinesterous inhibitors. There are different types of medicine. Danepazil is one of them. So we should start him with Danepazil and keep the patient at home and try to uh, keep him at home as much as possible. Now the question, uh, it's pretty much the same question. He had Alzheimer's and uh, he's, he become agitated a little bit. I don't want to read all the questions again, just to highlight the, the problems. So this is a patient with Alzheimer's and he was a little bit agitated. What would you do? It's the same answer. Just suggesting the patient's family not to rearrange the patient's apartment. So try to keep him uh, in the same place as much as possible. Don't move things around. Don't, uh, like you have so many relatives, just move one place to the other. So that makes him more confused. So just keep him at home and uh, don't rearrange his apartment. That's the answer. All right, next one. Next one. Okay, the answer is coming up. <laughs> All right. This is a question of another Alzheimer's patient. And um, he actually uh, had disease for a while, and he actually got a diagnosis of mild dementia, Alzheimer's type. And uh, they did some blood tests, which were OK. And uh, later on, he was given uh, the nepazole as a treatment, as I mentioned in the, in the previous question. And he, he was given the nepazole of 5 milligrams per day, once daily. And, uh, Later on, he became worse, and he got, uh, we increased the dosage of, of Donepazil to 10 milligrams per day, and there was no side effects of the medication. And the family just feels that, okay, it's improved, and how would you do with the treatment? Would you continue the medications, or would you stop it, or would you do anything else, or would you increase the dosage again? That, that's the, the point of this question. So he has been stabilized with Donepazil, uh, what, 10, 10 milligrams per day, and he's all right. The medication is very, very expensive. In Thailand, it's around 150 baht per tablet. So sometimes the, the relatives just consider that the patient is okay. He's taking it for a long time. Can you stop it? So uh, for the evidence base that we have right now, there's no evidence that we increase the dose of the nepazil more than 10 milligrams. So 10 milligrams is the maximum dose for, for this medication. And if the patient improves after treatment, you have to continue the medication. We don't know for how long, but we have to continue that. If you reduce the dosage, there's an evidence that patient may get worse. So the answer would be, so you just may uh, continue the current treatment is appropriate for this patient. Another patient. Uh, regarding the Alzheimer's. He is an Alzheimer's patient having history of alcohol drinking and he now ha having the dementia and also he had, uh, he's having moderate to severe hepatic impairment. So there's an Alzheimer's patient having liver problem and they're asking about the treatment. So Alzheimer's with li liver failure the family is asking for the most uh, appropriate medication with lowest side effects. Okay, you have different types of treatment for Alzheimer's right now. Uh, major categories are the, the cholinesterase inhibitors. We have three types of them, the nepazil, rivastigmine, and galantamine. And we have mimantine as another alternati alternative. So we have three types of medication, four, four, uh, names of medications right now. So they're asking which one would you prefer in this case with hepatic failure? Okay, can you vote? A is the nepazil, galantamine, which is um, cholinesterase inhibitors. Nothing, okay, and there's no cure for Alzheimer's, rivastigmine, uh, tecrine. Oh, most of the audience got galantamine, interesting. Interesting because galantamine is the medication that is, has the precaution and is actually should not be used in patients with liver, severe liver or renal impairment. So, <laughs> so you don't know that. Okay. <laughs> 
So it's not advised or it's contraindicated in these patients. So galantamine would be the one that we should not use. Uh, same as tecrin, which is the old medication, it has liver side effects, so it should not, it's, not, it's out of the market, we don't have it right now. Uh, rivastigmine is the choice, uh, but the side effect, the major side effect of rivastigmine is the nausea and vomiting and GI side effect. So if they are asking for the least, uh, the lowest side effect would be danepazole. I don't know this uh, questions prefer danepazole very much. <laughs> many danepazole in, in many questions. But anyway, uh, the correct answer would be this one. And uh, you can take it once daily. Rivastigmine, you have to take it twice a day. So it's uh, easier to use. Okay, another patient with Alzheimer's disease again, but he has, she, actually she, she has been on, uh, she has also cardiac arrhythmia, and uh, she's on warfarin for, for the prevention of, of emboli. And uh, recently, about one month, she had history of abnormal mental status, which is worse than before. And it, the key, qu key point of here, here is the waxing and waning of the symptoms. So it came mm -hmm. and went. Sometimes he's confused, sometimes he gets better. And she has been admitted for, uh, in the hospital twice before, after falling, but uh, there's no conclusive uh, uh, diagnosis. Now she has altered mental status again and waxing and waning. Without you did the physical exam, there was no focal deficit and uh, no evidence of external trauma. So we suggest you do the CT scan. And can you guess what the CT scan going to look like? So an Alzheimer's old lady had waxing and waning mental status change for the past month. History a little bit of fall in the past. Okay, can you vote for this question? It's very. I think it's a easy one. I think everybody get it, gets it correct. Oh, okay, it's not easy, it's very difficult. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you're thinking of chronic subdural hematoma because it's very clear that the mental status change has happened and she has a little bit of history of falling and uh, waxing and waning. That happens in, in metabolic encephalopathy and also in subdural hematoma patients. And she's on Wavrin, that makes it more difficult. <laughs> okay, and this is a, the example of patients with subdural hematoma. This is an acute subdural hematoma. You can see the white area of the blood in the subdural space. And this is a patient with chronic subdural hematoma. It can be very thick as this one. And compressing the brain, and patient may not complain of headache, just complaining of uh, mental status change. All right, another one for last one, I think, for the dementia. This patient has, uh, okay, the wife and the child of a patient, he had Huntington, Huntington's disease. So the patient has Huntington's, and the wife and the child was a little bit of concern. And uh, she wants to have a counseling. And uh, the patient is a 42-year-old man. Uh, he had Huntington, Huntington's disease for a while, and his mother didn't have it. And he is very ill, and he, has, he requires 24-hour nursing care. So the family is concerned about the possibility of having another, another uh, family member affected. So the, the question that, in this question was, the wife of the patient asked you direct, uh, uh, directly of the chances that the son of the patient would be affected with Huntington's disease. So how many percentage of the probability of the son to have the Huntington's disease? So can you vote for this question? Zero or 25, 50, 75, or 100? So majority gets 25. So what's the kind of uh, inheritance of Huntington's disease? It's autosomal dominant, right? So it's autosomal dominant. Would you like to change your answer? <laughs> so if it's autosomal dom dominant, it would be 50% chance of getting 
uh, inherited from a father. So this is mother and father, and uh, you have 50% chance of getting the disease. So Huntington's disease is a disabling uh, uh, disease which characterized by chorea movement of the, of the extremities. And he, uh, usually patients have some psychiatric manifestations, including depression, dementia, anxiety, and psychosis. And this is, as I said, transmitted by autosomal dominant. OK. Uh, all right. This is a patient with, this is an interesting case, which you may see in your PAC practice, and it can come up in the exam as well. This is a 54-year-old woman, and she, I'll read it uh, in detail because the history is important for this question. She was brought to the emergency room because of a sudden onset of recent memory loss. She was well before, and she was last seen by her husband around 4 p.m. yesterday, and uh, she was well at that time. And uh, when she returned home around 7 p.m., she could not remember her trip back home. She could not remember how she got back home, and she did not know whom she had met. Uh, and uh, she had profound loss of recent memory and could not recall what happened over the fa past few uh, days. And uh, there's no history of trauma or any drugs. On further questioning, she knows that her, she remembers patches of events over the last couple of weeks. He re her remote memory is intact. He remembers her husband. He remembers her uh, work. But she doesn't recall the things that happened a few days back. And uh, all right, so you did the mental test. And uh, she had memory impairment, only 0 0.3 recall at one minute. And uh, she came to the hospital and she was admitted. And after 17 hours, you examined her again and she was back to normal. But she still doesn't remember what happened during the time that, that the thing happened. So what would you think she's having? So she's a lady who was well before, now having problem with memory, only recent memory impairment. The Remote memory is fine. It happens very suddenly, and then lasted for a few hours, and then it's gone, totally gone. She was back to normal. So could it be a seizure activity? Could it be a uh, transient ischemic attack, or should it be something else? This is a classical syndrome of what we call transient global amnesia, which is a disease that causes recent memory impairment for only brief period of time, couple. Uh, hours or five to six hours, and then only recent memory loss, and then she, the patient would be back to normal. So with this disease, there are some that we don't know the etiology, but mainly the lesions would be in temporal lobe, which uh, which the the part that control controls the recent memory. Anyway, the, there are some postulations of relating this disease to migraine, uh, epilepsy, and some venous congestion of the brain. So what would you do for this patient? Would, would you do the ECT? Would you give gabapentin, sumatriptan, which is probably treating migraine? Or would you just not treat her? Or give, give her TPA for stroke? Can you vote for this? All right. This is difficult again. Dr. Sivapon doesn't want me to say it's easy. OK, so most of you got the correct answer. So there's no treatment. It's a transient disease and usually doesn't recur. So it happens usually just one time and, and just disappear. In some cases, they, they have recurrent TGA, but not very common. And there's no specific treatment. So just uh, advise the patient and uh, don't need to do anything. OK, all right, uh, another one. This is an, a 68-year-old. If you have the CT scan, just look at it first and just read the question. Uh, this is the CT scan of the brain of the patient. Is it normal? It's difficult to see, but you can see that the ventricles are a little bit of bigger than normal. So this patient had uh, 68. It's a, she's a 68 year old tax authority, attorney, and he suffered from head trauma because of robbery, robbery uh, six months ago. And his problem of uh, 
slowing down and having a lot of urinary accidents. And he had some monotonous speech, and he got the abnormal uh, gait, shuffling gait, and uh, did not swing his arm while walking. Had lead pipe rigidity at the elbow and cockwheel rigidity at the wrist, and the CT scan shows this thing. So, what's the most appropriate step in the in the management for this patient? Would you prescribe benzotropine? What is this for? Bromocryptine. These are for Parkinson's disease, right? The nepazole for Alzheimer's. This may be not an Alzheimer's case. Fluoxetine, uh, antidepressant. Or would you, would you refer him to a neurosurgeon for shunting? Okay, want to vote? Okay, go ahead. All right. Okay, we'll pass. <laughs> Everybody gets the answer. So this patient has got, what is it? Normal pressure hydrocephalus. So the ventricles are dilated, and he has got the classical feature of NPH, which are gait apraxia, shuffling gait like Parkinson's, gait uh, lower half Parkinson's. He has urinary incontinence, and he has some cognitive impairment. So this is another example of normal pressure hydrocephalus. So in this case, we would consider treating him with uh, chanting not giving any anti-dementia uh, drugs. So those are questions for Alzheimer's and other dementias. Have any questions for those questions? No, okay, let's go ahead. For the second part, stroke. Okay, start with this patient. Uh, he's a 62-year-old right-handed man with hypertension. He came to the emergency department because of history of stroke, so this is very simple. The question t tells you that he's having a stroke. So he smokes cigarette, whatever, and what's the immediate management in the emergency department would you do? So the question tells you that the patient is having a stroke. He has some, uh, he's alert oriented, some weakness on the right side, aphasic. So what's the treatment for the stroke of this patient? Okay, A, beginning the IV heparin, B, giving steroids, C, monitor oxygen, D, low, lowering the blood pressure, and E, restrict oral flu fluid. Okay, which one is the correct answer? Can you vote? What's the blood pressure? It's 192 over 95. Most of, yeah, most of us gets the C, which is the correct answer. For in stroke management, we don't know yet whether this patient has got ischemic or hemorrhagic strokes, so uh, we probably get a CT scan in, in the future. But for the emergency management, we don't give heparin right away because we don't know whether it's hemorrhage or not. And heparin is not the standard treatment for ischemic stroke anyway. Even though the patient has ischemic stroke, we're not giving heparin as a standard treatment. So we have to wait. Steroids, not the treatment. Monitoring oxygen is a good thing to do. Lowering the blood pressure to less than 140 is the thing that you should not do. For stroke, acute stroke, the threshold of the blood pressure for ischemic stroke would be 220 over 120. If it, the blood pressure is not higher than 220 over 120, just keep uh, the patient stay still in bed, don't have to give anything, unless the patient has to be treated with thrombolytic or has some other indications. Restrict all oral fluid is not the point here. Okay, for ischemic stroke, we have general management, like airway, breathing, circulation. If the patient is dehydrated, we usually give IV fluid. We don't give antihypertensive unless the blood pressure is very high. We try to treat fever as quick as possible, control the plasma glucose, and maintain oxygenation. We have some specific treatment for ischemic stroke. We have thrombolytic therapy, which has to be given within how many hours? <laughs> Three hours. 
three hours after the onset. If the patient has got a stroke, ischemic, and came in within three hours after the onset, you may consider thrombolytic treatment intravenously. And uh, some of the specific treatment as uh, antiplatelet aspirin within 48 hours, anticoagulant in some cases, and admitted to stroke unit. Okay, another patient. This is a 55-year-old right-handed man, uh, no medical history. He came with a uh, with problem with his eyesight, actually. He had so many accidents. At first, he had motor vehicle accidents because he couldn't see on the left, and he thought it's a problem with his left eye. And later on, he got another problem uh, of hitting something on the left. He could not see things on the left side. And uh, he was then told by a police officer not to drive. That, that's, the police officer is so good that he knows that the patient has got a problem. And, uh, and, but he didn't uh, believe him, so he continued to drive. And he thought he'd gone to an another accident, the third one. So he had another car on the left side. And uh, he had some problems with his memory as well. He could not remember what he was doing while driving. And uh, he had some transient left arm numbness and uh, headache on the right side. And uh, later on, he came to the hospital and he was, uh, he was examined. And he was found to have left-sided visual extinction. What is visual extinction? It's different from visual field defect. In this case, if the patient has got uh, abnormal vision on the left side, you have to think whether he has problem in his eye, left eye, or the problem in the brain causing visual field defect, or the visual inattention or extinction. So in this case, we, uh, the, the question, I mean, the, the person who examined him did the test of visual field, and he did not have any visual field defect, but he had visual extinction, meaning that if the uh, stimuli comes two sides at the same time, he would ignore on one side. That's called visual extinction. And we have to do the double simultaneous stimulation to find out this problem. And he had normal visual acuity. So the other examination was normal. So you should tell the patient that he will, A, can go home, but cannot drive for six months. B, you can, the patient can go home, but he cannot drive today. C, he needs to be admitted and uh, have to be evaluated. D, he needs to be seen er emergency by an ophthalmologist. Or E, he'll need to be evaluated urgently by a psychiatrist. Okay, can you vote for this question? So we'll send you home, we'll send him to a psychiatrist, ophthalmologist, or admitted to the hospital. Okay, all right. So this patient might have a stroke, and the area of causing visual extinction is not the occipital cortex, it's the area in the parietal lobe near the occipital, uh, it's called parietal occipital region, which is uh, responsible for, for visual uh, extinction. In some cases with the visual problem, they may have occipital lobe infarction, which is not this case. In, in occipital lobe infarction, like in this patient, in this CT of this patient. The patient may have visual field defect on contralateral side, and if it's a posterior cerebral artery, there is a macular sparing which, you can be, which can be tested by the perimetry, not by the wiggling of the fingers. So this patient is having a stroke, so you should admit him and uh, work up for the cause of it. Another patient. Uh, this is a 68-year-old man, diabetes, poorly controlled hypertension, and he had right-sided weakness for seven hours. And uh, he had the weakness and it stays stable for seven hours. And he did not have any sensory complaints. Physical exam shows that he had no speech problem, just right-sided weakness, only motor weakness, no sensory complaints, no sensory symptoms or signs. And, uh, okay, so what's the problem that he's having? Seven hours of right-sided weakness, no sensory symptoms, no aphasia. What would you do? You might think of 
patient having one-sided weakness, it should be the lesion should be in the brain, okay? The brain on the left side because the weakness on the right. He doesn't have aphasia, meaning that the lesion is not at the cortex. So it should be somewhere else. No signs of brainstem abnormalities. So it should be somewhere in the subcortical region. And uh, there's no sensory involvement. The weakness was uh, on one side. So we would consider him having the pure motor hemiparesis. And this is part of the clinical syndrome of the lacunar infarction. So a small vessel deep in the brain causing only weakness on one side, no sensory involvement, no, no cortical involvement. So this is a pure motor hemiparesis case. So what would you do? Can you sh would you check urine for drug screen, give entry-coded aspirin, give TPA, obtain MRI, obtain non-contrast CT scan? So we don't have the CT scan of the patient yet. We don't have MRI yet. So the correct answer would be, I would say D or E. We should do the imaging of the brain. CT scan is the be good screening test, but if it, the lesion is very small, you don't see it. MRI is a better test. You can pick up very small lesion uh, easier, but uh, sometimes it takes longer time to, to obtain it. So the correct answer, I would say either D or E. You don't have the answer of the, of the, uh, the CT scan or MRI. You're not giving aspirin. Uh, RTPA is contraindicated in this patient because he has stroke for more than three hours. And uh, one more thing that you should consider is that is, uh, stroke has different types. It can be ischemic or hemorrhagic. In the previous case, we think that he might have lacunar stroke, which is mainly caused by ischemic uh, lesion. But in some cases, they have small hematoma, which, cause, which uh, result in weakness just like lacunar stroke. So we, can know, we don't know for sure whether it's ischemic or hemorrhagic, so we should get the MRI or CT scan first. Just showing you that stroke is not ischemic. We have a small percentage of is, uh, hemorrhagic, hemorrhagic stroke, including intracerebral hemorrhage and subarachnoid hemorrhage. Okay, another case. He is a diabetic man, uh, 66 year old, and uh, he had problem with his mental status for the past three days. And he was uh, complained, uh, his wife complains that he, he has not been himself for the past three days. He used to, uh, he was a very joyful person, but he's now more kind of apathetic to his grandchildren. And he looks kind of tired and sad, not his usual state. It just happened three days before. So it happened very quickly three days ago. He hasn't been like this before. So physical exam was okay, no grossly deficit, no gross deficit. What would you uh, guess the MRI is gonna look like? Would you think that he'll have frontal lobe, parietal lobe, or pontine or cerebellar lesion? Okay, can you vote for this question? Is so the problem is the patient with acute onset of apathetic syndrome and uh, probably uh, depression syndrome. Okay, most of you got the correct answer, the left frontal lobe. So apathy, apathy is part of the front frontal lobe syndrome. Patients with bilateral frontal would have kind of apathetic mood. And in, in left frontal is the area that can cause depression. So if the patient has organic depression syndrome, not a psychiatric problem, you should consider the lesion in the left frontal region. So this patient might have a left frontal lobe lesion. Uh, and in this case, for three days, it could be a stroke. Okay. Another patient, 67-year-old man, man uh, had problem with his vision. She had, oh, it's not a man, it's a woman. She's, she had 10 minutes ago had abrupt loss of vision in her right eye. And she felt like a shade coming down over her eye. So it's like the vision in his right eye is abnormal. It's like shading coming down. There's no pain or discomfort. And that's it. And she had some physical exam, it's normal. So would, what would you do for this patient? Would you give her thrombolytic? Would you do the ultrasound of the carotid? Would you 
do the coronary artery bypass? Would you do the angiogram or would you get the MRI of the brain? So this is a patient with loss of vision in her right eye, very sudden and classical shading uh, type of, of blurring of vision. So can you vote for this question? So the patient has got uh, abnormal vision in one eye, so that means that the problem is the, in the anterior part of the visual pathway. Oh, okay. <laughs> Anterior part of the visual pathway, meaning it could be a problem in the eye or the, in the optic nerve, right? It's not the occipital lobe or any, any visual uh, radiation. It should be in the eye or the optic nerve. And the, the problem began very suddenly, lasted for 10 minutes. And it's the shading of the, of the, of the blurring of vision. This is a classical case of, of uh, ischemic neuropathy of the optic nerve. And uh, we call it transient monocular blindness, or another term is amaurosis fugax. So loss of vision in one eye for a while. And you should consider, look for the vascular pathology in this case. Mainly the cause of this problem is caused by carotid disease in the neck. So the screening test for carotid disease, the best, easiest screening test would be the carotid ultrasound not the angiogram, because angiogram is very invasive. So you should do the ultrasound first. If it's abnormal, you go for MRA or angiogram. So thrombolytic is not the, the answer. Bypass coronary is not the answer. Uh, MRI of the brain is not the answer, because if you want to do, you should do the MRA, MR angiogram, to look at the blood vessels in the neck. OK, another pr patient. This is a 70-year-old man with a uh, sudden onset of speech difficulty that started about six hours ago. Okay, it's history of hypertension, cigarette smoking, coronary artery disease. So when you talk to him, he appears very frustrated, frustrated because he understands everything. So he understands, but he could not speak. He has trouble speaking, and the speech was not fluent. So what would you think he's having? What do you think he's having? He's having toothache or <laughs> so it sounds like he's having motor aphasia, right? Motor aphasia, uh, trouble expressing uh, the words. Where's the lesion for motor aphasia? Okay, in the brain, <laughs> right? In the brain. Where in the brain? So it should be in the left frontal lobe where the Broca's area is located. And there's, the question is not asking for the Broca's area. It's asking for the brain, this area, what's the artery, which artery supplies the Broca's area of the brain. So it's basilar, middle cerebral, vertebral, anterior cerebral, or posterior cerebral. It's very, it's very difficult, so I'll answer myself. So it's left middle cerebral artery. OK, everybody knows that. So it's Broca's area. Uh, and middle cerebral artery distribution. And this is our case who had the same thing. He had motor aphasia. And you can see that there's an infarct, the hypodensity lesion in the left, uh, very close to Broca's area. And this is supplied by the middle cerebral artery. Okay, another patient. It's 42 year old African American and had severe bursting headache, very sudden severe headache. And he had well-controlled hypertension uh, treated before. There was no neurological deficit. And uh, after uh, waiting for a while, he became uh, unconscious. Initial lab was unremarkable. The uh, CT scan was done and it was normal. No subarachnoid hemorrhage no subdural hematoma. So what would you do for this patient? Sudden severe headache, very sudden, and he became unconscious later on. CT scan looks okay. So would you admit him to observe his neurological conditions? Would you order angiogram for the brain? Would you do the lumbar puncture? Would you send him for MRA? Would you just repeat a scan within 24 hours? Can you vote? A 
Okay. So, 32% C and D. Okay. This is a case where you suspect subarachnoid hemorrhage, right? Sudden severe headache, and he deteriorates after a while. But the CT scan doesn't show the subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you could do both, actually. But MRA or MRI is not very sensitive for subarachnoid hemorrhage. The best thing to diagnose subarachnoid hemorrhage in this case would be lumbar puncture, because you get the fluid and you know whether there's any hemorrhage or red cells in the CSF or not. MRA is probably not the answer, because you only get the picture of the blood vessels. You may or may not see the, the aneurysm in this case. If you don't see aneurysm, so what's next? The diagnosis, diagnostic test for subarachnoid hemorrhage should be lumbar puncture. CT can miss uh, more than 10% of the cases of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So the correct answer would be perform a lumbar puncture. Okay. All right, any questions about stroke problems? No, okay, no questions. All right, we'll go on for epilepsy part. Okay, this is a simple one. A girl, two-year-old girl, brought to emergency room because of generalized seizure, lasted only two minutes. And she had fever for the past two days. And she has been pulling her right ear, meaning that she has something in her right ear. And she was found later on that, on the physical exam, that she had otitis media on the right ear. And that causes the fever of 39.7 Celsius. So she had seizure after a very high fever because of otitis media. So what's the next step of the management? Would you order a head CT? Would you, okay, the neurological exam was normal after, after the seizure. You, would you order the neuro consult, get an EEG, or do the uh, synthesis, or prescribe antibiotics and, and, and treat the fever? Okay, can you vote? Okay, all right, everybody, most of us got it right. So, so this is a classical case of febrile seizure. So you know febrile seizure, it co occurs in children, six months to six years old. It could be generalized seizure, not, not focal seizure. It should be very brief, and uh, the children should not have any neurological deficit. And that happens after a very high fever. So the, the, the children, the child is back to normal, no neurological deficit, and she was brief, so she can be reassured, and you found the source of infection. So the patient can be reassured that she is having a febrile seizure and just go back home and uh, close monitoring. All right, another boy, six-month-old little boy who, bo who was brought to the office for a checkup. And uh, and his mother says that he, he uh, his birth story was one unremarkable, and uh, three months of age he began having seizure-like activity, and it was diagnosed as infantile spasms, or a salam type of of attack, and uh, his maternal uncle in the family had a tuberous sclerosis. So this patient has got a seizure type of, of infantile spasm and has a family history of tuberous sclerosis. So the question is asking what kind of cutaneous finding would you expect if the patient is having the tuberous sclerosis? Okay, can you vote for this question, please? So the question, they can just write a simple question. What is the skin lesion of tuberous sclerosis? <laughs> oh, okay. All right. So most of us got the correct answer. The A, Ashley Macules is the correct answer. So for tuberous sclerosis, this is a diagnostic criteria which you don't want to remember of them. But uh, there's many, there are many cutaneous manifestations. 
for the neurological manifestation, seizure, especially the infantile spasm, is one of the most common uh, presentation. And uh, Ashley Mackles, and as I mentioned, it's, a, uh, it's another neurocutaneous syndrome, autosomal dominant, and it's associated with seizure, mental retardation, and some intracranial calcifications. It, for cutaneous findings, ash leaf macules is one of the common findings. And it's a hypopigmented area with a regular border. And it can be present at birth and you should be, uh, it should be found by the age of two. And these are some other uh, cutaneous findings for tuberous sclerosis. This is the adenoma sebaceum in the face. This is what's called chagrin patch and the uncle uh, fibromas in the nails. And for the CT scan of the brain, you can see the subependymal nodule. Uh, they can be called tuber, which is like the tuber in the, in the ground. And these are the small tubers in the brain near the ventricles. And there's an MRI of the patient showing the lesion periventricularly. Okay, that's the tuberous sclerosis, which can be the question. Okay, another patient, she's a 23-year-old woman. She was brought to the emergency department. She actually, this is a quite interesting case and many, many questions about this problem. We have to listen it for, to it carefully. So she was standing on the line waiting for something and she suddenly collapsed. Sometimes when she laughs or uh, when she joking with her friends, she suddenly collapsed. And she denies loss of consciousness, but she just collapsed. She just uh, went down to the floor. And, uh, and uh, she denies any pain or any other symptoms, except for being scared that she'll be collapsed any time. And she's worried that she's probably having some seizure problem or something. And uh, her grandmother had a similar problem. On physical exam, she was normal. Routine lab was normal, and uh, but she has she's complaining that uh, she is a very sleepy person. She can be very sleepy very easily. Although she sleeps through the night, during the daytime, she she still feels that she is very sleepy. The problem is that uh, she is a very sleepy person. She collapsed many times uh, while she was joking, laughing, or even standing. So the question is asking whether what you should do for this patient, whether you should assure her that this most likely vagal, vasovagal syncope and she'll be okay. Can, should you call a neurology for probably narcolepsy, call psychiatry or do the EEG or just release her home and uh, it's probably exhaustion. Okay, can you vote for this question? <laughs> 39 for B and D. So some of you would consult neurology for narcolepsy, some of you would do the EEG. So the question is that uh, whether the patient is having a seizure activity or a, a, a seizure, but she actually, she denies loss of consciousness during the attack. So if the patient is having a seizure, it's very unlikely that she collapse and still remembers what, what happening, what's happening. So this is very unlikely, and there's a clue that she's very sleepy during the daytime. And this is the syndrome of narcolepsy. And uh, narcolepsy is a syndrome which we don't see every day. And uh, I got this picture from the internet, and it's very striking that patient can just stumble down to the uh, plate while eating or just fell down on the floor. And uh, the clues are, excessive daytime sleepiness. The patient is usually very sleepy most of the time and they can fall asleep uh, in a very appropriate uh, situation, inappropriate situation, and uh, it's irresistible. There are some other associated symptoms such as cataplexy, sleep paralysis, paralysis hypnagogic hallucinations, and automatic behavior. For cataplexy, it's very dramatic. 
this is a loss of tone in this the patient that in the question she might have cataplexy as well so she is the patient with cataplexy would have the loss of muscle tone loss of muscle function triggered by laughter anger or even surprise or fear and uh, could be conscious during the episode and this is called cataplexy and in patients with narcolepsy syndrome they may have hypnagogic halluc hallucination which is a vivid often often frightening dream like experience that occurs when she, the patient is not uh, not fully awake and they might have some automatic behavior like uh, doing things uh, automatically like putting things away doing uh, during sleep episodes and uh, and he, the patient usually no recollection of it. So this syndrome, uh, together with, uh, consisting of the cataplexy, hypnagogic hallucination, and hot automatic behavior, uh, is called narcolepsy syndrome. And and in the patient in the question, I think the patient is having a narcolepsy, and usually we consult neurologists for that. Okay, just two more questions very briefly before we go for break. This is another, pa another patient with a similar uh, episode of, of necrolepsy syndrome. And this question is asking, what should you do for this patient? We are suspecting narcolepsy. She is having the uh, sudden loss of tone while laughing. And uh, it's the same thing, same type of question. So what would you do? Would you do the EMG? Would you do the sleep latency test, would you order a CT scan, EKG, or HLA testing? So answer would be do the sleep latency study, multiple sleep latency study. Because these, these patients can be very sleepy very easily, so the sleep latency is very short. So if you just put them to a very quiet place, they just go to sleep very quickly. And that's one of the diagnostic tests. And another question is just following the first one. What's the treatment for this syndrome? Would you give calcium supplement? Would you put the CPAP while sleeping? Would you give haloperidol? Would you give methylphenidate or would you give valproic acid? So the answer would be the methylphenidate. So in this kind of uh, syndrome, treatment of choice would be amphetamine, but we don't use that. We use methylphenidate to stimulate the patient and make them awake. Uh, to treat narcolepsy. I think we have some narcoleptic persons around. <laughs> so it's time for uh, to return microphone to our moderator. Thank you. And, and, and I need you to practice hypnogogic so you can say it three times quickly <laughs> and come back in just about five minutes and we'll continue. <laughs> that's a great, that's a great Okay, here we go. All right, welcome back. พูดเร็วไปมั้ยคะเอาภาษาไทยไม่เร็วนะพูดช้าไปให้เอาเร็วกว่านี้ข้างหน้าหน้าหมาบอกว่าช้าไปพูดภาษาไทยแป๊บน
be hypoglycemic migraine simple partial seizure or TIA? All right, can you please vote for this question? Okay, so some of you still answer a simple partial seizure. So it should be complex partial seizure because the patient loses conscious, lose her consciousness during the spell. So if it's a partial seizure, it should be just motor or sensory, not uh, involving the consciousness. So uh, as you know, seizure is paroxysmal disorder. It usually occurs abruptly and ends very abruptly, but you can have post-ictal period. And usually last, the seizure ti uh, time would usually last one or two minutes. And it could be recurrent and stereotypic. And uh, there are phases of seizure. Some patients will have aura before the seizure, and there's an ictal phase where the patient actually sees, and post-ictal period where the patient can be drowsy or can be confused for a while. And there are two types of seizure, this, uh, the partial and generalized seizure. And for partial seizure, it can be divided into a simple partial seizure, where the patient is uh, conscious all the time and having some focal, like focal motor seizure. If it's a complex partial seizure, patients can have abnormal consciousness. And some of them may have automatic so moving face or moving hands or do something which is abnormal. And these ty two types can be progress to a secondary generalized seizure, and these are called complex partial seizure. For the generalized seizure, it can be uh, primary generalized, Capron just generalized, or starts with partial and then progress to generalized seizure. And for generalized seizure, it can be, it could be absence like uh, in children, myoclonic seizure, atonic, tonic, clonic, or very common tonic-clonic seizures, and infantile spasm, as I mentioned, in the case of tuberous sclerosis in, before. So this, that patient has got complex partial seizure. Okay. Another patient has, again, brief episode of loss of consciousness, and uh, she came to emergency room, and uh, she actually recalled that before she had the the episode of losing consciousness, she had, uh, she felt like nauseated and began sweating and became pale. She did not remember, uh, uh, I'm sorry, she did not have any memory loss or confusion after the, the event. So she was unconscious for a while. Before the ep episode, she had nausea and sweating. After that, she was fully awake, no post period. So what would you think this patient is having? A, uh, and, and what would you do for this case? Would you order a CT scan? Would you do the EKG? Would you do the EEG? Would you just reassure the patient? Or would you do the whole term monitoring? Okay, can you vote for this case? Is it a seizure again? Oh, most of the uh, ordered EEG. So I, I just want to uh, emphasize that this patient has premonitory symptoms before the attack. The symptoms were nausea, sweating, and became pale. These are not unusual for, for seizure. When you have seizure, you can have like sensory symptoms like aura, visual aura, uh, autonomic symptoms like feeling uh, sick in your stomach, but became pale and sweating is not usually not the premonitory symptoms of seizure. And uh, they didn't say any tonic-clonic movement during this, the attack, so it doesn't help. And more importantly, this patient did not have memory loss or confusion after the attack, so this is very unlikely for a generalized seizure to be regaining consciousness fully just right away. So this suggests you to the diagnosis of syncope instead of seizure. So with the syncope, you have to think whether it's cardiac syncope or just vasovagal syncope. 
And this patient is likely to have, it's a, she's a young woman, and, uh, and uh, no, uh, no history of heart disease before, it's very likely that she might have vasovagal syncope. And in this case, you just usually just provide reassurance and just uh, follow the patient. No need for EEG if the history is so clear that the patient is not having a seizure. Okay, I'll just pass this one. All right, another case, 12-year-old boy. Uh, he had a problem because of eye fluttering episodes that last several seconds, very briefly. So the patient would have the eye fluttering last for a few seconds, and then he's, he's back to normal. And it happens during the day for many times. It may occur up to 10 or 20 times per day. So the patient would have eye fluttering, and then back, and then having the problem again. And uh, there's no history of, of other illness. He had a couple of episodes of brief loss of consciousness, and uh, and she had he had problem of uh, thinking not clearly afterwards. No medical treatment at that time. So the major problem is the the eye fluttering lasting couple seconds. What do you think? Uh, this is a classical case of absence seizure, which happens only in the children. You don't diagnose absence in the elderly unless they have it at the, um, from the children from young onset. If the same same syndrome occurs in elder in, in older p people, you have to think of complex partial seizure type. They can lose their consciousness for a while. They can have uh, like abnormal movement. But in children, uh, this type of abnormality points to absence type of seizure, and the most uh, uh, useful diagnostic test would be the EEG to look for the classical 3 hertz spice, uh, spike wave pattern. So if the patient is absent, he should have the classical EEG. So the correct answer for this question would be the EEG. Okay. All right, we go on for the other problems. We had like dementia stroke. Epilepsy, which are the major categories. Now we're going to a smaller categories. Uh, there are so many questions about vertigo as I look through the, the questions. And uh, it's very common uh, things that you see in your practice and, 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 and I think you have some idea from these cases. And this is a 32-year-old previously healthy woman. And uh, she came because of history of dizziness and spinning sensation. So dizziness doesn't have to be uh, spinning. So if it's a, there's a spinning sensation or there's a feeling that uh, the patient is imbalanced, feeling imbalanced, may point to vertigo instead of dizziness. So, but uh, this patient has spinning sensation. And it occurs when she's lying down in bed. And uh, when she roll over to one side, the spinning sensation becomes worse, and she also becomes nausea nauseated and vomit. She denies any tinnitus, hearing loss, or double vision, any neurological deficits. So if she lies still, the symptoms would go away. So this is a class of symptoms of uh, positional related vertigo. When she lies on one side, she rolls over to one side, the spinning occurs, and together with nausea and vomiting. If she lies still, if the patient lies still for a while, the spinning sensation is just gone. So what would you think this patient is having? If she comes to your office, you might have to do some tests. For example, this case, they did the whole pike maneuver. And uh, just throw the patient to one side of the bed at a time and look at the eyes to look for the nystagmus. There, and there are some classical nystagmus for this uh, type of, of, of uh, vertigo. And uh, if the patient has history of, of positional related vertigo, points you to the diagnosis of, of positional vertigo, the most common cause of positional vertigo is benign paroxysmal positional vertigo. Uh, the abbreviation is BPPV. And if you do the whole pike maneuver, you'll get the nystagmus and uh, it could be downbeat with your one ear down and upbeat on the other side. Uh, 
Anyway, if the patient has got BPVV in this case, what would you do for the treatment? A, she may be benefit from vestibular rehabilitation. B, she should be sent to emergency department for further evaluation, or she should have MRI, or do, do you give diazepam or meclizine? Okay, what's the answer? Can you vote for this case? Okay, everybody gets it. So, if it's a benign paroxysmal, ver po benign paroxysmal positional vertigo, or BPPV, uh, as I said, vertigo can be the sense of imbalance or sense of spinning. The room is turning around or the self is turning around, and uh, the causes of vertigo can be divided in two major categories, the central cause of vertigo or peripheral cause of vertigo. vertigo. For peripheral part, the most common syndromes are BPPV, Meniere's disease, and vestibular neuronitis. But for central lesion, it could be anything in the brainstem or cerebellum. Uh, just to show you the semicircular canal, just to remind you what's the, the cause of uh, BPPV, which is the otolith in the semicircular canal, causing uh, change of or moving the autolith in, in each direction. And this is the Dix Hall Pike maneuver where you want the patient to sit and just throw him on the side down and turn his or her head rapidly and look at the eyes to look for the nystagmus. And this is what we do for this patient. We do the vestibular exercise. We basically we'll just give the patient uh, the the position that will move the the autolith to the place that is not going to irritate the semicircular canal again. So this is the best treatment for BPPV or peripheral vertigo at this type. Okay, for another case, this is a case of 40-year-old man who came because of dizziness, and uh, he had <laughs> he had the problem feeling that the room was moving. He denies any tinnitus, hearing loss, double vision, dysphagia, or dysatria. But uh, the problem is she has, he, he's having the problem of vertigo, but he denies any nauseated feeling or any vomiting at all. Although she, he doesn't have any neurological deficit, but the symptoms came and went. Uh, he had the symptoms for an hour and then it's gone and he had, he's having another episode again. It's not related to position or any alcohol or any drug use. He's taking some medications. So for evaluation, in this case, he's having vertigo, right? And uh, there's no true history of, of position relation, relationship to the, any position. And there's no clue for Meniere's or neuronitis. And more importantly, he doesn't have any feeling of nausea or vomiting together with the vertigo. That makes you think of probably he's having central lesion. So for this question, they're asking for the uh, examination that you should pay particular attention to. So in this case, if you think of central lesion, you might have to do the exam of the cranial nerve uh, in detail because the patient might have some abnormality in the brainstem which causes the, the, the vertigo in this case. Oops. Okay, another case. This is a 54-year-old woman and with uh, dyslipidemia and poorly articular pain and uh, she had some lightheadedness. Oops. And some vertigo. And uh, the spinning is noted occur, uh, to occur while lying supine and made worse when uh, rapid turning of the head. He doesn't have any vomiting, ear pain, or fever. And she's taking some medications. But on the physical examination, you found that she had some hearing loss. So she's having vertigo, no really nausea or vomiting, but uh, on examination, there's a hearing loss together with a vertigo. So 
if you find a hearing loss in this case, what that would suggest you to which diagnosis? Can you vote uh, for this question, please? So vertigo again. Vertigo can be B9 paroxysm of vertigo, can be a central lesion. We have to look for a lesion in the brainstem. And if you have hearing loss with vertigo, what's the diagnosis? Okay, so it could be unilateral vestibulopathy, but if it's a vestibular dysfunction, it should not, uh, the patient should not have hearing loss because it's a vestibular part. So if the vertigo comes with hearing loss, you have to think of Meniere's disease. Ver BPPV doesn't cause uh, hearing loss, migraine does cause hearing loss, otitis media that the patient doesn't have. So Meniere disease is one of the common causes of vertigo. And it can be called idiopathic endolymphatic high drops. And it causes rotational vertigo, hearing loss, and tinnitus. Sometimes patients will complain of sensation of fullness in the ear. So when they have vertigo, they have fullness of the ear, some pain in the ear, and tinnitus at the same time. And then uh, after a while, the, the symptoms go away. And then sometimes it recurs later on. And this is caused by abnormal of abnormality of the endolymphatic system in the inner ear. And uh, this is a pathology. OK. Another case of dizziness. OK. <laughs> it comes. The answer is always comes up. OK, this is an old man with cancer, coronary heart disease, diabetes, hypertension, and comes in because of vertigo. And he felt that he was on merry-go-round. You know what merry-go-round is? He liked to <laughs> merry-go-round. Mamun, mamun, mi kon sai la, ah, yu kong lang la. Go, when you name boban mamun. Okay, like <laughs> he was on a merry-go-round, and uh, it lasted only five minutes, very briefly. In patients with uh, central vertigo, sometimes it lasts very few seconds or very short period, and it just goes away. For Meniere's, it usually lasts for a while. For BPPV, it depends on the position. If the patient lies on the same position for a while, it may go away. But if they move the head, it's going to come back. But in the central vertigo, uh, in some cases, especially for the vascular cause, it can last very briefly and then go away and then come back. And that suggests the central cause of vertigo. And in this patient, uh, he also has some neurological abnormalities and he lost his consciousness for a while, and he became dysarthric, and, and he had no weakness or, okay, he, he denied any feeling of weakness on his extremities, but he, had, he was dysarthric, meaning his speech was abnormal. And he was a little unsteady, maybe indicating some cerebellar ataxia. So the question was, uh, the most correct statement about this condition is, so it's very simple. The question is very long, but the clues were vertigo, lasting briefly, and some neurological deficits, mainly dysarthria this artery and uh, unsteady gait. So he, he might have central lesion causing vertigo. So the treatment should be, should be, the problem is likely to be related to vascular disease of the brain. So uh, vertigo in the old man, with some neurological deficit in the very uh, brief period. So there are some clues for differentiation uh, between central and peripheral vertigo. As I mentioned earlier, central vertigo usually is less severe. If the patient is has having very severe vertigo, vomited a lot, it suggests you to, to the peripheral type of vertigo. But if the vertigo is not very severe, less nausea and vomiting, and if the vertigo comes with headache and neurological deficit, that points you to central type of vertigo. But if the patient has vertigo together with severe nausea, vomiting, and tinnitus, and in, in BPPV, they may have position-related vertigo, and association with hearing loss, it, that points you to peripheral vertigo. There's an exception of hearing loss because in some patients with uh, stroke in the brainstem, especially stroke in the anterior inferior cerebellar artery. Uh, the abbreviation is ICA, if you know it, ICA syndrome. ICA syndrome is a stroke in the brainstem and cerebellum. 
and because I can also supplies the the ear inner ear. So if the patient has ICA stroke, they may have unilateral hearing loss as well. So in that case, hearing loss on one side may not indicate peripheral vertigo in that case. That's an exception. And in some cases of cerebellar stroke, they might have uh, position-related type of vertigo. But it, the position is usually uh, upright and lying down position, meaning that if the patient Stand, sits up and they have vertigo and they lie down and the vertigo disappears, that can be central type of vertigo. But if it's the BPPV, the per paroxysmal positional vertigo, the position that's related to vertigo, usually rolling over on one side, the kang side, the kang kwan, huh, rolling over, the kang side, the kwan, 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 Alright, next is infection. Okay, next is we come to another part of neurological uh, problem, which is very few questions about infection because I don't think it's common in Caucasian or Western countries anymore. But we still have some questions of infection. Okay, this is a 37 year old man comes to the emergency department with one day history of headaches, fever, and neck pain. So headaches, fever, and neck pain. And he is more, I mean, has been more sleepy today. And when, you, when the patient, uh, when the relatives talk to him, he is, looks very sleepy. And uh, he also had a seizure uh, on the day. And his temperature was very high, 40.1 Celsius. He's lethargic, uh, but otherwise was normal. His white count is a little bit high, 2000, uh, 27,000. His chemistry was normal. So the most appropriate management or initial step of management is to do one of these. So 37-year-old, history of headache, fever, neck pain, high fever, and very I mean, lethargic, drowsy. What would you do? So A is begin uh, antibiotic therapy, begin carbamazepine because he's having seizure, do the CT scan, do the EEG or lumbar puncture. So can you uh, give the answer? What's the diagnosis? The diagnosis should be bacterial meningitis. He's having a very high fever and headache and fever and also and also seizure. So it's having a very severe disease. Since he's having a very high fever, headache, and seizure, if he has a bacterial meningitis, meaning that the meningitis is so severe that it may cause thrombophlebitis of the brain. That's why he's having seizure. So he's having a very severe bacterial meningitis. For the answer, actually, you can think of these two answers, begin antibiotic therapy, or perform a lumbar puncture. But the correct answer would be start the antibiotics right away. Because in this severe meningitis case, you don't waste your time. It's an emergency case. Each minutes and each hours that you waste, it can cause uh, more mortality and morbidity. So you can start antibiotic right away, and then you do a lumbar, lumbar puncture. And you still find the organisms, and you can still culture it uh, positive from the CSF. After you begin the antibiotics, you just do a lumbar puncture right away. You don't need to obtain the, the CT scan because it's very uh, uh, acute meningitis. It's unlikely that the patient has complications. So this is a type of bacterial meningitis that usually uh, progress very rapidly, and patients can become comatose within one or two days. The most common organisms in children is the H influenza. For adults, in normal hosts, it could be a strep pneumo or a Neisseria meningitis. In elderly, you have to think of Listeria monocytogenes. So treatment is high-dose high antibiotics, and uh, there's a consideration of steroids in children and in some cases with bacterial meningitis. So the meningitis there are different types of meningitis. It could be bacterial, which is very severe, and it could be viral, which is milder. Usually a patient doesn't have a consciousness problem, and it could be 
eosinophilic, which is common in our country but not in Western countries, tuberculosis and fungal meningitis are differential diagnosis. So this is another case. So you see the question is, is a boy from Hong Kong, so it's not Caucasian anymore that's having uh, infection of the nervous system. This is a boy from Hong Kong, and uh, he's having a fever, vomiting and lethargy. And uh, she, he had mild neck stiffness. So he was examined, and finally lumbar puncture was performed. And CSF uh, showed elevated of the pressure. And 250 white cells, and predominantly lymphocytes, decreased glucose and increased protein. CT of the brain shows hydrocephalus. And uh, what would be the diagnosis of this case? Hong Kong boy, <laughs> fever and neck pain, and neck stiffness. CSF shows high protein, low sugar, some white cells. So what's the treatment? Okay, let's vote for it. This is difficult again. I think everybody gets the correct answer. Okay, all right. So it's very much like TB meningitis, tuberculosis meningitis. Uh, it doesn't say how long the patient has the symptoms, but you can see, uh, just get the result of the, of the lumbar puncture. It shows the white cells and high protein, low sugar, which is a characteristic of tuberculosis meningitis. And also, CT scan is showing hydrocephalus, which is also common for tuberculosis meningitis, which usually stays at the base of the brain, com uh, including the pathway of CSF, and uh, resulting in hydrocephalus. And for TB meningitis, if you look at the CSF, you can see that it's usually uh, yellowish because of the high protein content. And sometimes it clots like a cobweb, uh, and gone, you know. And uh, this is a CT scan showing the a little bit of hydrocephalus. And in a severe case, they can have uh, vasculitis because of the, the tuberculosis and the inflammation at the base of the brain near the cervical villus. And this patient has got multiple infarction in the deep structure. And this is a classical case of tuberculosis meningitis. And the treatment should be anti-tuberculosis agents, usually at least four agents. Okay, only two questions for, for infectious cause. Another uh, important problem for Westerners, and some in, in our population, is multiple sclerosis. And uh, some examples of the cases, and usually the questions are very long, you just look for the diagnosis. Okay, you found it, multiple sclerosis in this case. 44-year-old woman with multiple sclerosis, and uh, many history of weakness, whatsoever. And yesterday, one day before, she noticed diminished sensation along the lower left trunk in the front and back. So she has new deficit yesterday, and she has been diagnosed multiple sclerosis for a while. Okay, she receives some treatment, you just read it. Takes about an hour to read all of this. And then, okay, finally the question was, at this time the most appropriate pharmacologic treatment is it doesn't matter what she's having because she's having multiple sclerosis and now she's having uh, uh, another episode of neurological deficit. And if you read this, there are some evidence that she's having central nervous system lesion. She has sensory level in the trunk. She is having gait disturbance. So uh, she was treated for many years. And they're asking what's the appropriate treatment for recurrent attack of multiple sclerosis. So what would you think is the appropriate treatment for the relapsing or the acute attack of multiple sclerosis? Should you give interferon, beta 1b, or a steroid, gabapentin, clotiramer, or promopaxel? OK, let's vote for it. I think this is an English test, not uh, <laughs> Not the neurological questions. Just try to find out if you can read all this tenseness. <laughs> okay, if you, you, if you find out what the question is, what the real core of the question, as I mentioned, multiple sclerosis recurrent attack, new attack yesterday. 
So the treatment would be corticosteroid. And usually we give high dose steroid either uh, methylprednisolone or, or usually we, if they have uh, measurable deficit, we'll usually give methylprednisolone for a couple of days and then follow by oral prednisolone. Okay, another case, another question which is very long again. And I'm just telling you that just multiple sclerosis doesn't mean that they're asking for the answer of multiple sclerosis. This question is kind of long, but just to tell you that this patient has multiple sclerosis and has been treated for 10 years and now she's been on steroid and she's having steroid again. And the question is, the, she's noticed my unsteadiness of walking, so she's having another attack. But the question is, what is the, uh, what in the orders should be, you, should you be writing? So multiple sclerosis on steroid, what should you order? The answer is insulin sliding scale. Just to ask you, if you have a patient who is on steroid, what you should do? So steroid causes hyperglycemia. So I'm just telling you that uh, you have to read the question sometimes more carefully than, than the previous one. Previous one is more simple. It's just asking the, the, the treatment, but this one is more tricky. Okay. All right. This is again a very long question. This patient is a okay, 23 year old woman comes to the emergency department complaining of sudden loss of vision in her right eye, and uh, that occurred earlier in the evening while she was out in the restaurant with her friends. So it doesn't matter. Okay, she's losing her vision in her right eye, and uh, she has a uh, little bit of fever, and she has no past medical or surgical history and medication is some contraceptive pills. So the major problem is blurring of vision in one eye. Mentioned earlier that one eye losing vision is the problem of the anterior visual pathway, either the eye or the optic nerve. So you look at the physical examination. Her pupils are equal, round, and reactive to light and accommodation. And uh, however, when you swing your pen light from eye to eye, it appears that the right pupil constricts more slowly and dilates more rapidly on the left than the left. What's this? This is this sign. So the pupil seems to react when you when you uh, you swing your light, but if you swing the light to one eye and then you move it to the other, the pupils instead of constricting, it dilates. That's called Marcuscan pupil. Okay, it's Marcuscan pupils. So if you uh, put the light on one eye and the pupil constricts, that means this eye is okay, but you can't be sure until you do the Marcuscan test or, or, or move, one, uh, move the light from one eye to the other. If the, nerve, uh, the optic nerve is not working well, you move the light from one eye to the other, the pupil, instead of constricting, it's going to be dilate. So that's a sign of optic nerve involvement in this case. So he's just losing her vision, and the physical exam shows that she is having a, uh, an optic nerve problem. So the question is, based on these findings, this patient is most at risk of developing any of these uh, syndrome. So the patient is having optic nerve disease, very sudden, 23-year-old woman. So the, the di differential diagnosis would be ischemia of the optic nerve, right, because it's very sudden, or inflammation of the optic nerve. Inflammation of the optic nerve is called optic neuritis. And this is a young uh, woman, woman, and uh, she doesn't have any history of, of vascular risk factor. So it could be optic neuritis or, or the inflammation of optic nerve. So this patient is ha having optic neuritis, and they are asking the most uh, at risk of developing what disease. So is it going to be acute le leukemia, ALS, Bichette's, Hodgkin, MS, or SLE? So can you uh, please vote for the answer? Okay. Oh. Uh, 
โอ้ไม่มีข้อ f โอเค all right <laughs> so the okay most of you got the got the answer e which is multiple sclerosis as you know multiple sclerosis is a disease of of in inflammation of the central nervous system and the optic nerve is not the it's actually not the peripheral nerve it's actually the part of central nervous system so it can be affected by multiple sclerosis and it's it's a common finding that the patient with multiple sclerosis will have abnormality of the optic nerve it could be optic neuritis clinically or sometimes you do the evoked potential and you find abnormalities of the optic nerve without any clinical evidence of the of the visual problem. So if the patient has got optic neuritis, there is a chance that she may, may develop MS in the future, but uh, not always. Okay. All right. I'll pass this question. Okay, going on to the peripheral neurology. We went to the central part, mostly, and now the peripheral neurology. This is a 13-year-old girl came because of her feeling tiredness, especially at the end of the day. And review of the system also reveals that she noticed some blurring of vision, and now uh, she thinks she, that she had some difficulty swallowing the food. And uh, physical examination, she had bilateral ptosis and normal deep tendon reflexes. The strength uh, is normal. But if you let her do it again and again, repeated efforts lead to noticeable weakness. Her sensory memory intelligence were normal. So this patient is having problem of being tired and uh, some weakness, some difficulty swallowing and bilateral ptosis. And that occurs mainly in the afternoon. And some of you are having this syndrome right now. Bilateral ptosis in the afternoon. So, what would you do to help with the diagnosis? Okay, can you vote for the answer? Botulism titer, CPK, CT scan of the brain, Lyme test, Tensilon test. Okay, all right. Patient's got myasthenia gravis. Very classical case of MG. Uh, weakness uh, progress during the day and uh, some fatigability when you ask the patient to do the same thing for for uh, some time they get more weakness and the test could be tensilon test we don't have tensilon in, in Thailand but we do the prostigmine test instead okay again another patient uh, who's got the same thing uh, diagnosed as myasthenia gravis. The question is diagnostic, uh, diagnosis will most likely established with, so I don't want to ask, uh, read the, the whole thing, but to just to uh, ask you, in the patient of MG, if you want to do a tensilon test, you do it, but if you can't do a tensilon test, what else can you do? Can you do the CT, EEG, or EMG nerve conduction, lumbar puncture? And the answer would be the EMG and nerve conduction study. And the more specific term is the repetitive stimulation test of the nerve to see whether there's a decrementing response of the, of the response. Okay, another patient with, uh, just look for the clues and you found Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is uh, the diagnosis of this case. And this patient is a 35-year-old pregnant woman, has Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And, uh, okay, they were asking that, uh, what's the probability of the infant to have the disease? And the infant is a boy. So this question is asking about the uh, type of, of inherited of this disease. You know Duchenne muscular dystrophy? It's a type of muscle disease causing weakness of proximal muscle. And uh, it's X-linked recessive. And again, if it's X-linked recessive and the, this lady is having uh, a boy, what's the chance of his, her, her son to get the disease? So it's 50%. Okay, the, pa the mother, it's X-linked recessive. So the mother is a carrier, right? 
the carrier passes to his to her son, half of them will get the disease. Okay. Another case of 57-year-old man uh, with weakness and tingling in his legs for one week. The symptoms began over a couple of days and uh, initially at the feet. Over the next several days, his weakness progressed to involve more proximal leg muscle and he had some difficulty walking and uh, also the tingling as well. And there's, there are no complaints of bowel, bowel and bladder dysfunction. And uh, okay, so he's having progressive weakness of the legs and tingling sensation over the legs as well. So the most likely, uh, the, the, okay, on the physical examination, there is most likely to be one of these. So what disease are you thinking of? Progressive weakness for a week with water and sensory. What kind of disease is it? There's no bowel and bladder. So progressive weakness can be disease of peripheral nerve, disease of muscle, disease of spinal cord. It's very unlikely to be disease of the brain. So there's no bowel and bladder in this function. So it's very unlikely to be a spinal cord problem. So it could be nerve or muscle. And this patient is complaining of tingling sensation. There's some sensory involvement. So it's not muscle disease because muscle disease doesn't cause any abnormal sensation. So it's likely to be a nerve prob problem. So if it's a nerve problem, acute neuropathy, progressing symmetrically in one week, what disease are you thinking of? So it's very likely to, to have the acute polyneuropathy and it could be Guillain-Barré syndrome. And f when you look at patients with Guillain-Barré syndrome, the most pertinent clinical signs is the absence of reflexes. Okay, Hemianopia is not related. Hyperreactive reflexes is not in this case. Okay, as you know, Guillain-Barré syndrome is the also called AIDP, acute uh, inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy caused by demyelination mostly uh, in the nerve and caused by autoimmunity to the, to the nervous system. And there are a classical Guillain-Barré syndrome, which uh, clinical syndrome consists of motor weakness, proximal and distal equally uh, affected. And it could be, usually it's large fiber sensory neuropathy. And pertinent clinical finding is a reflexia. And it can be progressive in four weeks and then usually plateau and improved after, after that. And this is usually monophasic and can happen post uh, viral infection or some uh, gastrointestinal infection. There are uh, varieties of uh, Guillain-Barre variants like Miller-Fisher syndrome, which uh, consists of ocular involvement, ataxia, and reflexia. Some variants like Amman, the motor predominant, and MSAN, these two are not demyelinating disease, they are more exonopathy, but it's a, they are variants of Guillain-Barre syndrome. I don't think they are asked for that, it's too detailed. Okay, in the case of a uh, 48 year old obese woman and complaints of numbness and tingling in her right hand and arm. And uh, history of fairly controlled diabetes. Exam shows that her right hand was numb. Only three fingers was, were numb. And uh, only first three digits. No atrophy. What's the most likely diagnosis? Very easy. Numbness of three fingers. It's unlikely to be the brain. It could be the nerve root, but she doesn't have any neck pain. The most common uh, cause in diabetes, obese women, is carpal tunnel syndrome, okay? So the compression of median nerve in the, at the wrist caused by uh, moving the, the, the wrist too much and patients usually have sensory complaints of, or, or findings over here and they may have some atrophy of the thena muscles. Usually treatment should be the, uh, okay, I'll pass this, okay. Should be the compression of the, of the, uh, entrapment. 
Just go for the last one, headache. And headache can be the very problemat problematic uh, cause of, of neurological problems. This is a 30-year-old woman. He comes with uh, visual hallucination. And she had recurrent episodes of flashing zigzag lights and lasted for about 30 minutes. And then the lights will go away. She gets some throbbing pain behind uh, one of her eyes. And then she became nausea and vomited. Uh, and photophobia and, and phonophobia. And she had these episodes for many times per year. Neurological exam was normal. So what do you think she ha she's having? Yes, yeah, very classical for classical migraine with visual aura, headache, throbbing in one side, nausea, vomiting, photophobia, photophobia. So she's having migraine. They're asking what's the management for this patient. Would you do the imaging? Would you give haloperidol for the hallucination? Do you give sumatriptan or other triptan? And uh, so you can ask her to come back or start therapy with uh, paracetamol. The so answer would be prescribing triptan because the rest would be uh, not relevant. And usually paracetamol is not working for migraine, so, uh, so you should have something uh, else like triptan or, or NSAIDs or uh, ergot to treat migraine. So for migraine, it's a kind of headache which is very common. It occurs in about 10% of population and uh, can be very severe and can be aggravated by physical activity. Uh, classically, they have aura phase and then headache phase and then recovery phase of post grown phase. So it's a disease that does, has many phases. And different type of auras can be visual, like flickering light or flashing lights, or even sensory aura can happen. Can happen. And for treatment of migraine, you can prevent the attacks by avoiding precipitating cause, and some medications can prevent the attacks. But if the patient has the attack already, you should prescribe the medication that will abort the attack. The most commonly used are NSAIDs and triptans. Ergot, uh, this also can be used, but with some side effects and precautions. OK, another case of patient with recurrent headache, this is a case of headache which occurred in the past seven days, seven days, and it's periodic. And for the headache, it occurs in most days over two month period, and then it's gone. So it came and went for two months for one year, and then disappeared for one year, and then come back, came back for two months, and lasted for about one hour. And for a classical case of this type of headache, it usually occurs at night. And it usually helps when you give some oxygen therapy. And this is a classical case of cluster headache. So migraine occurs in ladies, but cluster headache usually uh, occurs in men. About 30, 40 years of age occurs at night and uh, comes in cluster. OK, some other cause of headache. Uh, this is a, not a common type of headache, but you have to think about it. I'll just go through it very quickly. Headache, blurring of vision, losing weight, and jaw claudications are the clue for temporal arthritis. And uh, if you diagnose temporal arthritis, you should give the patient a systemic steroid at a very high dose. And ESR is one of the clue to diagnosis, but you don't have to wait for ESR. Because in some patients, ESR may be normal. So if you diagnose temporal arthritis, just go for the treatment. And, uh, and, uh, and this is just a criteria for the diagnosing temporal arthritis. And uh, it could be the patient should be old patient, more than 50 years of age, new onset of headache. And temporal artery abnormality, you can, when you press it, sometimes it's tender at the, at the artery itself. And ESR is usually higher than 50. And there are some other uh, associate findings. For example, jaw claudication, when they chew something, they get uh, fatigued very easily. And they have muscle pain, uh, which is called polymyalgia rheumatica. And some patients may lose their weight or have anemia as an associated findings. So this is temporal arthritis. So I think I covered 
most of the part of neurology. I covered the uh, stroke, dementia, epilepsy, which are which covers the most of the questions, and uh, peripheral neurology, some headaches, MS, which is not common, but we found some of them. So I think I'll stop here for my talk, uh, and uh, I guess you. You, most of you got most of the answers right, so I think you know all of the answers already. But anyway, good luck if you want to take the exam, and uh, yeah, thank you very much. ช่วยถามหน่อยนะคะเอ่อค่ะมีหน้ามาเหมือนคนไม่โครโฟนเลยค่ะอาจารย์ถามเกี่ยวกับเมื่อกี้บอกว่ามีคนไข้บีพีพ